Okay, so I'm just gonna go through a typical workflow of how you can access the 3DEP data through open topography. And this workflow is, is gonna be very familiar to some of you, but we do have a fair amount of people online who are not super familiar with open topo. So I'm hoping this will be useful to them. Uh, the 3DEP data set's a little bit different. So I'll try and highlight um, some of the unique features of it as we go through the workflow. Um, most people, uh, there's basically two ways where you, where you can get the 3DEP data. You can either go uh, from this data tab, you can go to the data catalog or the find data map. Um, if you go to the data catalog, um, if you go under the USGS 3DEP tab, you'll see a listing of the data alphabet alphabetically. So if you know the name of the data set or you can filter by state, uh, that's one way of getting it. But the majority of our users will get the data through the find data map. And so, as Chris mentioned, the data is in green here. As you zoom in, you'll see the spatial extent of the polygons. And uh, for this tutorial, I'm going to use the uh, Washington Mall as an example. So if we zoom in and select that area, underneath the map, it'll highlight which data sets uh, intersected that area of interest. And just as a quick note, you can sort of see some a snapshot of metadata by clicking on the link. And we've scraped some metadata from the USGS XML so you can get things like survey date, um, survey area, total points. Um, another feature I want to highlight that not many people know about is as, you, as OT has gotten more data sets, you'll, certain areas will be very cluttered and it's hard to see which data sets cover which area. Um, so you can often click this little pin here and it'll sort of highlight the coverage of just that data set. So you can see this, in this case, this covers, I want to look at the Washington Monument. So you can see that this data set covers that. So I'm going to select that data set uh, to examine. And to do that, you just click on the Get Data button. So this will take you to um, what we consider the landing page uh, for a data set. And for the 3DEP data, most of the landing pages will be very similar. Um, in the overview, we try to give some uh, updates about the 3DEP program and the um, Amazon Entwine bucket that Howard Butler and his team put together. And we provide some links there that you can get some more detailed information about those uh, projects. We also provide um, just some basic metadata about each particular data set within the 3DEP. So this metadata pertains to this Maryland, Virginia data set. And we give things like the total number of points, survey area, a rough estimate of point density. And then we also scrape uh, some metadata such as like the survey date, which would be really interesting uh, to a lot of people as well as when the data was published. Um, we also link to this full data, full metadata link here. We'll take you to the USGS uh, resources that have the XMLs for all of the last files. So if you need a deeper dive into the metadata, you can get it that way. And we also link to uh, Howard's USGS.entwine.io site. And this site um, is run by Howard and his team at Hobu. And here we'll see um, basically, this is showing all the resources that are in that Entwine-based uh, public Amazon bucket. So here you can see what data is being processed. You can also click on these links and get a visualization of those data sets uh, using a tool called Poetry that I'll talk about a little later. Um, so once again, you the area of interest is highlighted in the map. Uh, you can search by, uh, you can change to a, a satellite view if it happens to be like a feature that you're interested in. In this case, I want the, the Washington Monument. Um, another feature I would just want to highlight that many people aren't aware of is the heat map. So if you select on the heat map, you'll see areas where other users are downloading data. So this shows, um, obviously for this tutorial, I've done some searches over Washington Monument, but other people have searched, you can see over Lincoln Memorial, uh, Jefferson Memorial, White House, Capitol. Um, this feature is, is really nice for especially um, 
people who are doing flight collects or planning any kind of data collection because they can use this as a metric as to where people are really downloading the data um, and, and maybe prioritize those areas for data recollection. So once again, I'm gonna zoom in over the Washington Monument. And then I'm just gonna step through each of the parameters here and just highlight um, basically what goes into uh, create, downloading this data set. Um, as I mentioned, Howard and his team, they, they really did a lot of the heavy lifting of sort of standardizing this data set. So they took all of the LAS formatted data and put it into an Entwine format. And as part of that, they also reprojected the horizontal coordinate system to all be in Web Mercator. Um, and this is a very common projection for web mapping applications. However, for analysis or uh, it's not really the best projection to use because it can have a lot of uh, distortions in area, especially if the data set is uh, far away from the equator. So what we did uh, as part of including this in Open Topo is we calculated what the local UTM zone is for each data set. And so we provide that as an output option uh, as one of the projections. So you can see here, you can output in either UTM zone 18 and either the NAD83 based ellipsoid or the WGS84 ellipsoid. And naturally you can still output in the native web Mercator or in a WGS84 lat lawn uh, coordinate system. But if you want to do any kind of gridding, you need to use the projected uh, UTM zones. Um, we could also probably, we were set up where we probably could expand this to do any kind of projection on the output. But for right now, we're, we find most users are content with a UTM projection. <clears throat> um, we've also um, harvested um, some metadata. So we've, we've pulled out the the vertical datums, most of the time this is NAV D88, but sometimes it might be something else. So we've reported what those values are for the vertical datum. Um, we've also harvested all of the classifications per data set. And at the current time, we, we're not including that, but um, in the future, we could potentially list out all of the classifications and users can filter by classification. Currently, we enable users to classify uh, by grounds, so users can select this box and essentially get a digital terrain model. So that would only pull out points that are classified as grounds. Um, you can also exclude noise, which would basically pull out, remove any data that's been classified as noise. So the next step is just the, your output formats. So most people are familiar with LAS. Um, and as Chris mentioned, LAZ is just simply a compressed form of the LAS uh, point cloud format. Um, we set it as default because the compression ratio is really quite amazing. And so this will help speed up the download of your, of your data as well as use less disk space. Um, so it's a really, um, we really recommend that you use the LAZ format when running a job. Uh, the next two stages, 2A and 2B, deal with gridding of the data. And so this is where Open Topo starts to um, shine in the sense that it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting in the background of creating derivative products. The first method is using the TIN method, triangulated irregular network. Most people are probably familiar with that. And I won't go into the details of how TINs are created, um, but I will highlight for most of our processes and parameters, we try to put little tool tips uh, that's that I in the circle. And so you can get a little more detail about um, how, what the algorithm does, how it works, or what any particular parameter does. Um, so it'll give you a little guidance into how to set those. So this um, section 2A is creating a triangulated irregular network grid. Uh, you can set the output resolution. You can also control uh, how big the triangles are. If data is particularly sparse, you may want to set it to uh, not flag an elevation there and maybe flag it as undefined. So you can control that with the triangle sizes. Um, the default output is GeoTIFF, but you can also output as ERDAS Imagine or as Esri's ARC ASCII grid format for any kind of Esri products that you may want to use. Uh, the second gridding um, method we, we, we term local gridding. 
Basically, it's also creating an output raster. It's gridding up this irregular point cloud uh, that you've selected, and you can specify whatever grid resolution you want. Um, and then at each grid cell, we're applying a search radius. And so then within that search radius, we're running statistics on any uh, points that fall within that radius. And you can select which parameters you want to see. So on the left hand, you'll see the options that you can choose. You can choose to report the minimum value that's within that radius, the maximum, the mean, the inverse distance weighted, the standard deviation, uh, the point count, or you can just return all of them and have it uh, layered in a single image. And you can obviously control the size of your output grid. You can also control the size of that search radius. So if you have data that might be sparse, you may want to increase that radius so that you capture enough data to run meaningful statistics. Um, if you want to, we do have a null filling option. Again, if you have sparse data, you can run what we call a sort of a roving window. So for each grid cell that's undefined, you can search an average data over the three by three, five by five, or seven by seven cells. So it'll take those surrounding cells, average your value, and then apply it to the undefined value. And then once again, you have GeoTIFF as an output option, because that's kind of the most common a lot of software can read it, but you can also output an ERDAS Imagine or an NV formatted raster. Uh, moving on to derivative products. Uh, this will create hill shades and slope grids, um, but I should note that it will only run if you have selected a grid of uh, within 2A or 2B. So it won't one run directly on the point cloud. So you need to select a grid from either 2A or 2B or both, and it'll create a hill shade and slope grid uh, based on those grids. And again, you can output in GeoTIFF or ERDAS Imagine. Uh, the next step is sort of a newest feature. So if you haven't used OT in a while, this might be new to you. It's uh, the 3D point cloud visualization. Um, this uses a sort of uh, browser-based web visualization called Poetry that was uh, designed by Marcus Schutz. Um, if you select this box, um, when the job runs, you'll get an email and it'll have a link and you click on that link and it'll open this web browser. And you, the nice thing is, is you don't need any other software. Um, you could just view it all in the web browser. And I'll give you a, just a quick look as to what it looks like. So this is <clears throat> my, my job of the Washington Monument in 3D plotting in points in this poetry web viewer. And you can do it, a whole lot of things with it. I won't go into all of it, but if you click on the hamburger icon in the upper left, um, you'll see a, a menu pops out on the left hand side with a lot more options um, and you can do things like not only plot the elevation, but you can plot intensity um, or classification. Um, if your data set has RGB values, you can plot by RGB. Um, you can filter by classification and by uh, return number. Um, so there's a whole lot of things you can do. One nice thing you could do that I want to highlight is you can do some just basic measurements, which is kind of cool. So we can measure the height of the Washington Monument if we click on the little height, height tool. And then you could just click at the base and at the top, and it'll calculate the height of the Washington Monument at 168 meters. Um, so you can measure areas and other things. I, like I said, I won't go into all of it, but I would really encourage users to uh, check this feature and really play with this tool because there's a lot you can do, and it's a really nice way of interrogating your data set. Um, so that's what you would see if you check that box, you'd be able, you'd gain access to that web, web viewer. And it's nice because it's uh, localized to your selection that you chose. Um, the next section 4B is for a visualization of data. And this is more um, creating like static images, PNGs of the hill shades, as well as Google Earth files. And this is a nice feature in the sense that some people just want a, um, a nice graphic to use in a report or a proposal. And so if you select this, you'll get a grayscale hillshade PNG. You can also get a color-based uh, PNG of the hillshade, or you can get a Google Earth version of those DEMs and then pull it into Google Earth and 
orient it how you want and um, make an image that way. And lastly, uh, Chris uh, spoke about Tau DEM and mentioned, mentioned it. So here's the options that you have. Um, it's an open source program. It's very similar to Esri's Arc Hydro tools if you've used that. So you can create like things like pit filled DEMs, drainage basin areas, flow direction. Um, it's really powerful and it's great for hydrologic analysis. I would caution um, that it is very process intensive. So your jobs will slow down if you start selecting a lot of these products. So just um, be aware of that um, if you do choose that option. So then uh, you just basically then put in a, a name for your job and click submit. And this is again where the magic of OT is happening. It's doing everything in the background. It's sort of going out to Amazon, subsetting uh, that data set based on the bounds we selected, returning an LAZ, and then doing all of the gridding uh, and raster creation in the background so that the user doesn't have to do it. Um, so it's going through each step and you could either wait and have, see this job produce, or you can just go do other things, wait for your email. When you click on your email link, it'll turn to a job like this. Um, and what's nice, you could click on the duration and see actually how long each of these steps is taking. So here it's very fast because it's a, such a small area. It's um, querying in three seconds and then doing each of the steps in about three seconds. And I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but if you are running jobs during this demo or shortly after, try and keep your jobs fairly small, maybe under 10 million points, because we have a lot of people on this webinar. And if everyone starts running huge jobs, it's really going to bog down the system and slow down everyone's jobs. So please be considerate of uh, fellow webinar attendees. Um, so again, here's the output that you get. You'd be able to download uh, your um, Royal Point Cloud, your derivative products, and here is that link uh, to the poetry view that I mentioned earlier. So you would just open that up and you'd get into this uh, poetry viewer to see um, the monument. There it is. And one quick thing I'll mention if I have time is um, the My Open Topo page. If you click on that, uh, your three depth jobs will be listed there and you could always go there and sort of select a job and resubmit um, by changing parameters. So it, it'll also keep a listing of all the jobs that you've run. Um, so it's a nice catalog to see what you've, what you've done. Um, so that is basically it.